They had a simple plan, which required nothing more than their craftsmanship and a little bit of luck. Everything else was simply provided by the prison. By then, Parkhurst was no longer one of the toughest jails in the British Isles. Instead, the institution was rampant with corruption and crime. In this video, we'll tell the story of the infamous Parkhurst escape that took place in 1995, when three inmates proved themselves to be craftier and more resourceful than hundreds of prison guards and officers. It was January 1995, a new year with new goals. But while many people dreamt of getting a higher paycheck or losing a bit of weight in the new year, these three men dreamt of escaping. Freedom was just outside, on the other side of the bars. Andrew Roger, Keith Rose, and Matthew Williams met in prison. All of them were serving life sentences. Two of them were, simply put, murderers. Andrew Roger was jailed for killing a swimming pool attendant with a crowbar back in 1987. Keith Rose was jailed in 1991 for the brutal murder of a woman. Matthew Williams was in prison for several crimes, including arson and bomb making. The three men became friends, and together they hatched a plan to escape prison once and for all. In 1995, Parkhurst was a chaotic place, the perfect breeding ground for crime. There were a number of reasons for this dramatic downfall of the prison. One of them was the continual building work at the jail, which started in 1988 and was supposed to have been finished in 1993. The building work gave a sense of instability and agitation to both the inmates and the prison guards, and the hierarchy was off. Prisoners controlled their daily existence with no objection from the guards. This made bullying and intimidation run rampant. Drugs and gambling were a normal daily occurrence, and many prisoners had, believe it or not, what one would call a steady income. The governor spent only two or three hours a week talking to the prison staff, much less than the 50 hours legally imposed. This meant prison staff had nobody who could realistically listen to their concerns. There was nobody who could ask them about their needs, about the security issues, about the state of the building, or the mental state of the prisoners. There was nobody to care that at some point the prison had been taken over by the convicts. Even more, the staff was largely untrained and the security technology was lacking. A sense of leniency was ruling over the prison. The day of the escape finally came. After months of planning and working toward their freedom, Roger, Rose, and Williams could almost feel it. It was the 3rd of January, 1995. New year, new them, preferably far away from Parkhurst and the Isle of Wight. It was a normal day. None of the three men wanted to draw attention to their little group. The more unnoticed they were, the better. They'd worked way too hard to have their plan crumble because of a nosy guard. And then evening came, and it was finally time to break out of that damned place. Parkhurst was maybe the perfect place for an escape if only one had enough courage. And Roger, Rose, and Williams had courage and skill aplenty. Once the idea of escape had taken root in their minds, all three men had started working toward their nefarious goal. Nobody had even flinched an eye once the group had started spending most of their time in the prison's metal shop. Perhaps it may have escaped everyone's mind that one of the three men was a qualified sheet metal worker. The guards would often lead the three prisoners to their own devices. They worked in the metal shop unsupervised free to create their own little props for the escape. Night fell over the Isle of Wight. The prisoners at Parkhurst were allowed to exercise in the prison's small gym every day. But on that evening, Roger, Rose, and Williams stayed in the gym after exercise. They went unnoticed, despite the fact that the guards had seen 10 people going into the gym in the first place, but only seven of them returned to their cells. With some 200 pounds between the three of them, the men set off toward freedom. Together, they walked about 600 feet without being seen, using their precious key to open doors. Everything was going according to plan. The men then went down to the prison workshop to get the rest of their tools. Roger, Rose, and Williams were incredibly crafty. They'd managed to make a huge ladder out of some goalposts. Nobody noticed. They'd managed to make a key, one that would help them see through their plan. It was a perfect copy of a prison officer's key made only from memory. Nobody noticed. They'd even managed to make a gun and acquire blank ammo. Once again, you guessed it, nobody noticed. Or maybe nobody wanted to notice. In reality, officers knew prisoners would often take advantage of the general noise and chaos to acquire illicit items through visitors. Even more, there was already a growing suspicion that some of the officers would bring illegal items in the prison themselves. Once they had the three-section ladder, the men made their way toward the 25-foot-high perimeter wall. Before scaling the wall, they had to cut their way through a mesh fence. Once again, they went unnoticed. Guards were supposed to watch the television screens 
and monitor the perimeter, but they were either untrained or distracted by other duties. And there were no alarms on the perimeter fence, despite 20 years worth of complaints demanding this additional safety measure. To top it off, some areas weren't even covered by the closed circuit cameras. The prison played a major role in the group's escape. They simply couldn't have done it without its precious aid. Their plan might have been harder to accomplish in any other place, but in 1995, HM Prison Parkhurst was just a pale shadow of its former self. The place has a long history, one that started in 1778, when Parkhurst was a military hospital and a children's asylum. Sixty years later, it turned into a prison for children. Its reputation was not a great one. Parkhurst was one of the toughest jails in the British Isles, and many criticized the institution for its harsh regime, especially since its convicts were mostly teenage boys. In 1966, Parkhurst became a top security prison, an austere place which inspired fear, but it was downgraded in the 90s, and as you can see, for good reason. After scaling the wall, the men were out of the prison, at last free, but they had to move quickly. Once they got out, Roger, Rose, and Williams walked to Newport, the county town of the Isle of Wight, while wearing their own clothes, which we can assume the men had acquired during their careful preparation for their escape. Once they got to Newport, the three of them took a taxi nine miles to Sandown. Their plan wasn't over. What good was their prison escape if they didn't manage to get off the Isle of Wight? There's only so much room to hide on a small piece of land in the English Channel. No. They had to get to a small, private airport between Sandown and Shankill in the east of the island and steal a plane. Keith Rose was going to be their amateur pilot. Fleeing by water was too much of a risk. No. They had to fly. Once they got to the airport, they only found a small Cessna 105, locked away in the main hangar. Rose was sure they could make it work, despite the fact that the Cessna 105 is a trainer aircraft meant for two people, not for the three heavy men. Perhaps they had no idea that the aircraft would have no chance of leaving the runway with all three of them inside. They used a crowbar to open it. Once they got inside, they were met with another problem. There was no cockpit key either. Rose used a piece of crude metal to try and get the engine going. The man struggled for a while, but it soon became obvious that his efforts were futile. And then, to make matters even worse, the piece of metal broke off. Half of it was now stuck in the lock. What now? Well, they had to hide. Surely they had hundreds of officers on their tail by now. In reality, nobody at the prison noticed their absence for two hours. It was a dog handler at Parkhurst who first noticed a hole in the wire perimeter fence. After that, it took an additional 30 minutes for officers to figure out who was missing. And while officers knew they had to start the hunt for the three prisoners, they had no idea how to go about it. Who should be called for help? Roger, Rose, and Williams hid in the small woods that littered the area. There were a number of abandoned farm buildings, each of them a perfect hiding place. The group managed to stay hidden for five nights. By the fifth night of their escape, the whole island was plastered with posters of their faces. They were cold and hungry and more than desperate. It was Sunday, January 8, 1995, when their luck turned from bad to worse. At about 7.20 p.m., the three men were walking along a road in plain view. That's when they were spotted by Colin Jones, an off-duty officer, who immediately flagged down a passing police motorcyclist. Ten minutes later, Roger and Rose were apprehended, but Matthew Williams had somehow managed to escape and flee the authorities. Williams was cornered two hours later and was immediately taken back to Parkhurst. Two of the men lost heart and gave up running just after a short distance across the field. Rose and Roger looked dejected. They didn't have any strength left in them, but Williams looked much fitter. He was desperate to get away and disappeared off across the fields, a police officer later told the press. 